Welcome back, Algebra 2 students, to another Regents Review video. This is the January 2017 Algebra 2 Common Core exam. This is where things start to get a little bit more tricky. The January 2017 exam, I thought, was a little bit harder than the previous two. These are going to be the solutions to Part 1, questions 1 through 12 of this exam, or this video, I should say. And um, before we begin, as usual, do not, under any circumstances, take these answers and cheat. It is not right to do. And the multiple choice, as, I'm, as I was going through it yet again, I thought that some of them were really difficult. So please make sure that you try the problems by yourself, then come here if you need assistance. Hit that subscribe button down below. Consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page and visit my website at www.nysmathregionsprep.com for more content in Algebra 2. Both of those links, the Patreon and my website, those links can be found in the, in the uh, description below. And uh, I use the TI Inspire CX Calculator, very powerful tool. I highly recommend it. That could also be found on my website. Without further ado, let's begin. Number one says, relative to the graph of y equals 3 sine of x, what is the shift of the graph of y equals 3 sine x plus pi over 3? So here's what you got to know. If the shift is inside of the parentheses, it is always going to be a horizontal shift. And its direction is opposite the sign. All right, so the direction is opposite the sign. So in this case... Since it is a horizontal shift and it's saying add plus pi over 3 units, we know for sure that if it's positive, you're actually moving to the left by pi over 3 units. Oops. By pi over 3 units. So your answer for this one is going to be choice 2. It is the opposite sign or the, or the direction is opposite the sign of what's given. You would think it's going to the right because it's positive. It's not. It's going to the left. Moving on to number two. A rabbit population doubles every four weeks. There are currently five rabbits in a restricted area. If T represents the time in weeks and P of T is the population of rabbits with respect to time, how many, sorry, about how many days, uh, of about how many rabbits will there be in 98 days? So here we go. Your formula to get this question right is P of T is equal to the initial amount of rabbits. Five rabbits, five cute little rabbits are there. And they are doubling, right? They double. So that's to the two. Raise two. Now we're trying to find we're trying to find out how many rabbits will there be in 98 days. Well, we can't just put down 98 days. We actually need to divide the 98 days by the four weeks because it doubles once every four weeks, okay? So 98 divided by not four, but 28, because there are 28 days in four weeks. You need to keep your units the same, people. You can't have days and weeks all in the same fraction. It just can't work like that. When you type this into your calculator, you get approximately equal to, um, what is that going to be in your calculator? Hold on one second. Let me type it in. 5 times 2 raised to the 98, 98 over 28. And that is going to be a population of 56.5 bunny rabbits. So your answer for that one is choice 1. Moving on to number 3. When factored completely, m to the 5th plus m to the 3rd minus 6m is equivalent to what? So in this case, again, do GCF dot trinomial. So we have the greatest common factor, followed by the difference of two perfect squares, followed by the trinomial method. Okay? So um, the GCF in this case is m. Take it out. We're left with m to the fourth plus m squared minus 6. And let's go ahead and continue to factor this. We could factor this by the AM method of factoring. What adds to positive 1 and multiplies to give you negative 6? That's just going to be m squared. That's an ugly 2 m squared um, plus 3, m squared minus 2. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is your answer. Um, you know, 
They say factored completely. Whoever wrote this question is actually mathematically correct. You could actually factor this a little bit further, but they indicate choice four is the answer. Perfectly fine. If you want to know why you could factor this more, send me an email. I'll tell you why. Number four, if sine square of 32 plus cosine square of m equals one, then m must equal what? Do you remember um, the identity sine square theta plus cosine square theta equals one, right? The thetas, theta is equal to theta. Theta must be the same. So if the sine squared of 32, if this is 32, then the letter M must also equal 32. Your answer is choice one. And if you chose choice um, two, you got confused. You're thinking back to geometry when sine and cosine are co-functions, which are complementary. You got confused there. But these must be the same. Must be the same. If you want to confirm it, type it in. Sine of 32 quantity squared plus cosine of 32 quantity squared. That equals the number 1. And you're done. Moving on to number 5. What is the solution to the system of equations y equals 3x minus 2 and y equals g of x, where g of x is defined by the function below? So the best thing to do is this. Okay? Either you could graph this line on this graph, or you could actually figure out what this parabola equation is. I say it's a little bit easier to graph this line. It's very simple. The slope is 3, and the y-intercept is 0, comma, negative 2. So graph this and go up 3 to the right 1. Okay, there's my first interse uh, intersection point. Up 3 to the right 1. Up 3 to the right 1. Up 3 to the right 1. One. Okay, so we know it's going to be intersecting somewhere up there. But regardless, we already have an intersection point. We're all right, we already have one. And it's right here. It's right there on the parabola. Okay? That point of intersection that you see right over here is the point one, comma one. So if you go down to your answer choices, um one comma one is there. Well, that's it. So so they were kind of nice to you. That is the only answer that has 1, 1. The other solution set is 6, 16. You see how we stopped at 1, 2, 3, 4. We stopped at 5. If you go one more, it's going to be up by 16. But they don't want you to graph that, so they were nice enough to show you 1, 1 and then 6, 16. Let's just say, hypothetically speaking, and it's not going to happen, but they, go, the, blah, but they put 1.1 as one of the other answers. This equation that you see here, g of x, is x minus 2 quantity squared equals g of x. You would have to graph that, then graph your line and figure it out that way. And that's only because that's a horizontal shift to the right by two units. Again, it's opposite the sign. All right, number six, which statement about statistical analysis is false? Okay, um, experiments can suggest patterns and relationships in data. Experiments can determine cause and effect relationships. Observational studies can determine cause and effect relationships, or observational studies can suggest patterns and relationships uh, in data. Okay, so experiments. Experiments could be controlled, but an experiment, you are setting up a hypothesis. An experiment, you're setting up a hypothesis and you're testing the variables. You are clearly suggesting patterns if you are having an experiment. So that is actually true. Experiments can determine cause and effect relationships. Absolutely true. If you have an experiment, you're testing the difference between two variables. For example, if I said to you, let's experiment students who have an increased amount of time spent on their phone compared to their test scores, the cause and effect relationships, as the amount of time you spend on that phone increases, your test score will go down. Okay, so that would be true. This is That's what experiments dis um, discover. Choice three, observational studies can determine cause and effect relationships. No, they can't. Observational studies, on the other hand, can suggest patterns and relationships. Again, observational studies, you're just observing data. You're, you're just observing. You're not drawing conclusions. So that's why your answer is choice three. Number seven, the expression m squared divided by m to the one-third raised to the negative one-half power is equivalent to what? So the best thing to do is this. Subtract these exponents first. 
So m squared minus a third, right? You subtract those exponents. And then you raise all this to the negative 1 half power, OK? So 2 minus a third, right? So we have m. 2 minus a third is 5 thirds. You could just type that into your calculator and raise it to the negative 1 half power. This is a power to power rule now. m to the 5 thirds times negative 1 half. This is m to the negative 5 over 6 power. Okay? That's one answer. I, I need to write that smaller. That's, that's pretty big. m to the negative 5 over 6 power, or as a, as a, um, as a radical with a positive exponent, it has to be 1 over the 6th root of m raised to the fifth power. That could also be an answer. Is that answer there somewhere? Yes, it is. Your answer is choice two. Okay? And that's how you do that question. Either one of those answers would be acceptable. Number eight, what is the inverse of the function y equals log base 3 of x? So by now, you should know this um, general concept. be equals n can be switched with log bn equals e. So what does this mean? An exponential function is the inverse of a logarithm. An, an exponential function is the inverse of a logarithm. So to put so to take a log and put it into an exponential form, we are going to loggy loop it. I call it loggy loop. So what? So to express the inverse first is we need to Take 3, raise it to the y, and set it equal to x. Well, 3, raise to the y, and set it equal to x. But we got a problem. We got a problem here. That's not the inverse because your exponent is y. Your y should be down here. Okay? So what did I do wrong? Well, for an inverse you need to first switch the x and the y and solve for y. So let's go ahead and do that right now. We get x equals log base 3 of y. OK, now we got something here. Loggy loop this. 3 to the x equals y. That's what we need. Choice 3 is your answer. We need to switch the x and the y, solve for y. That's how you solve inverses. Switch the x and the y, solve for y. And we got it. Choice 3 is your answer. Now, if you want to double check, all inverses are reflected over the line y equals x. So go to your graphing calculator and go ahead and graph um, <clears throat> log base 3 of x. And go ahead and graph uh, 3 raised to the x. See if it's reflective over the line y equals x. And as you can see, boom, it is reflective over that line y equals x. They're both equidistant from each other. So your answer is choice three. Moving on to number nine. Oh, God, I remember this question. I wanted to throw up. Gabriel performed an experiment to see if planting 13 tomato plants in black plastic mulch leads to larger tomatoes than if 13 plants are planted without mulch. He observed that the average weight of tomatoes from the tomato plants grown in black plastic mulch was five ounces greater than those from the plants planted without mulch. To determine if the observed difference is statistically significant, he re-randomized the tomato groups 100 times to study these random differences in the mean weights. The output of his simulation is summarized in the dot, pot, dot plot below. Given these results, what is an appropriate inference that can be drawn? So here's the thing here, people. Here it is. Here it is. Um, where is it? Black plastic mulch. I got to find it. Bla here it is. Black plastic mulch was five ounces greater than when he planted it in, in mulch compared to the one without. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw on my graph, I'm going to draw fi the five ounce mark. Okay? If I could draw it straight. Okay, this is ridiculous. Draw it straight. There we go. So this is the five ounce mark. Okay. What the exam wanted you to see is that there was some sort of an effect. Okay. 
look to the left and to the right of five ounces. You see here that there was some statistical significance that to the right of the five ounces for things that were grown in the mulch is growing. But then on the left-hand side, there these, these things here on the left-hand side, um, they didn't, they didn't grow five, um, five ounces greater. So let me read this to you again at the very end. To determine if the observed difference is statistically significant, he re-randomized the tomato groups one at a time to study these random differences in the mean weights. Okay? The output of the simulation is summarized in the plot below. So clearly, there was some sort of, there was something that took place on the right-hand side, because if your tomato plants are 10 ounces greater than the average or 20 ounces greater than the, than the average, that is a pretty big statistical significance. So the answer that the, that the um, answer key indicated was choice two. There was some sort of an effect observed that could be due to the random assignment of plants to the groups. Um, I don't like the end of this. I don't know why they decided to say due to... It's not due to the random assignment of plants to the groups. It's due to the fact that they ran the simulation multiple times and it just so happened that the black plastic mulch has some sort of an effect on the growth of plants. I don't know why they put due to the random assignment. I don't like that answer, but the answer is choice two. I think whoever wrote that question um, was not thinking that day. Okay, if P of X equals A, B to the X, and R of X equals C, D to the X, then P, X times R of X equals what? So, you need to know this exponent rule. Very important stuff. Here's the exponent rule that you need to know. The exponent rule that you need to know is X to the N times Y to the N is equal to X, Y to the N power. So, here's the deal. Um, if you take x in this case which is a and y which is b no i'm sorry c what you could do is you could rewrite a b to the x times c d to the x like this you keep the a's and the c's together and you keep the b raised to the x and d raised to the x together because they have that x attached onto them so your answer in this case would be a times c um multiplied by BD raised to the X power, okay? So we get AC times BD raised to the X power. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the answer to that question. Your answer is choice three. And that just goes back to the exponent rules. All right, number 11. The solution to the equation 18X squared minus 24X plus 87 equals zero is what? So the best thing to do is to use the quadratic formula. And it's going to be very complicated because there's a lot of math going on here. So the quadratic formula, remember, x equals negative b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So your a is 18, your b is negative 24, your c is 87. It's going to be very big. Just keep going with it. So we have negative, negative 24 plus minus the square root of negative 24 squared minus 4 times 18 times 87 all over 2 times 18. Okay, let's keep going. We got positive 24 plus minus the square root. I am so lazy that I'm not even going to type this in. I'm, I'll just tell you right now. It's negative 5,688 all divided by the number 36. Now, we need to simplify this gargantuan radical. So... You need to think of the highest perfect square that goes into it. If I take 5,688 and divide it by 36, 36 does work because 158 cannot be simplified any further with a radical. So this will become 24 plus minus the square root of 36 times the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 158 all over 36. All I did is I just expanded that radical. Now let me tell you what each part means. 24 plus minus, the square root of 36 is 6, the square root of negative 1 is your power of i, times the square root of 158 divided by 36. Now, i heart division, you're going to simplify these numbers. 24 divided by 36 is 2 thirds, plus minus, 
6 divided by 36 is 1 sixth. I, radical 1, 58. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the answer to this question. Your answer is choice 4 for that part. All right, and moving on to the last question, number 12. When g of x equals 2 divided by x plus 2 and h of x equals log x plus 1 plus 3 are graphed on the same set of axes, which coordinates best approximate their point of intersection? Honestly, graph this. You shouldn't, you shouldn't even be thinking about doing it algebraically. You should be going right to your graphing calculator and graphing these puppies. So we got control division 2 over x plus 2. Enter enter and we got log x plus one plus three all right there's your intersection point right there we could clearly clearly see it menu analyze graph intersection click click your intersection point is negative point nine comma one point nine and that is going to be choice two for that question just by graphing it on your calculator and that is the conclusion of this video. I hope it was helpful. Make sure that you hit that subscribe button down below. Consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page and visit my website at www.nysmathregionsprep.com. Both of those links can be found in the description below. And I hope to see you soon.